Please pass your cards inside out to be picked up at this time. While you are doing that, you know, all of us have things that get on our nerves. For some of you, it's preachers. Uh, for me, a couple of my top two I'm just going to share with you because it goes along with today's lesson happens to be restaurants, okay? Number one pet peeve has to do with drive-up windows or drive-through windows in some of these fast food restaurants. I am convinced, without a shadow of a doubt, as one man said, that whenever someone goes in and applies for a job at one of these fast food restaurants, but there's nothing wrong with working at a fast food restaurant, but I believe the manager asked the first question is, can you mumble into a microphone so no one can hear you? I'm convinced of that. Second pet peeve. I don't think there's a restaurant on earth that is so good and the food's so good, I want to wait an hour to eat there. And I've learned that when I go to a restaurant and somebody tells me it's 15 minutes wait, it's going to be at least a half an hour. So Vicki and I were out um, Friday night, I believe it was, and the person said, it's going to be about a 15 minute wait. And I told Vic, I said, watch. So I didn't complain for the rest of the 35 minutes till we were seated. We got to our table and I looked at my sweet wife and I said, I'm getting better, aren't I? She didn't miss a lick. She said, you've got a ways to go. <laughs> so I can tell my pet peeve is the restaurant. Her pet peeve's me, you see. Well, as we start today's lesson, Matthew chapter 23, Jesus is talking about the seven woes. In those seven woes, Jesus is telling us what bothers him here on this earth. It happens to be when people who call themselves godly in Matthew 23, the new dispensation hadn't started yet. Those people that call themselves godly, later on, those that would wear the name according to Acts 11, 26, Matthew 26 and verse 28, 1 Peter 4 about verse 16, call themselves Christians. He says, what really bothers me are those who attach my name to their lives, but they're only going through the motions. Now, Jesus in Matthew 23 explains the seven woes he has against the Pharisees. But before he begins, he lists, uh, before he begins the list of seven things, he has against them, he sets the stage this way. I want you to watch. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sat on Moses' seat. Now, as we get to this, of the seven woes six times, Jesus addresses specifically the scribes and the Pharisees. One time he addresses the blind guides, but he's still referring to them. So he says, they sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do, for they preach, but do not practice. You understand? Scribes and the Pharisees, the religious elite, those that are supposed to be the, the holier than thou, the high and mighty, if you will, wore the tassels, wore the robes, signifying who they happened to be. They wore the garb, just didn't follow everything God would have them do. Watch what they say. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They don't mind putting these things there. You see, the whole idea of this is, that verse 2 references them sitting on the seat of Moses, thinking they were you know, great successors or worthy successors to Moses. And Jesus does tell them, listen to what they have to say. See, a lot of times we have truth within us. You've run across first century uh, in Christians in the writing of the New Testament that had this same problem. You run across those same type of people today that talk a great game. That what they have to say is absolutely correct. But when it comes to living, they're a mockery. When it comes to living the life that they're professing to teach, there's a vast difference. I can't begin to tell you how many young people have come into my office and have talked to me about mom and dad. 
And how that, and I, don't ever ask me, I won't ever tell you, that's confidential, but you need to hear this part. Every parent's going to go home and say, did you talk, tell Jack this? No, it wasn't anybody here so far, so relax, parents. You have a chance, anyway. They come and tell me, say, the people that you see on Sunday morning are not the real people that live in my house. Talking about their parents. Remember that poll that I told you about? Years ago, I took the poll of, the, uh, of some kids in the, the congregation and, and asked them specific questions. And I asked a question about, and I don't remember the exact numbers now, the exact percentages, but I asked, how many times do you, do you see your parents reading and studying the Bible? And 10% of them said they do, and about 90% said never. How many times have you ever seen your mom and dad you know, ever having a devotional in your house. Again, about 10% did, 90% never. When have you ever heard mom and dad say, I love you? Or be affectionate toward one another, holding hands, arm around one another, you know, kiss goodbye, whatever it might be. Again, about 90% never. And you ask about praying. Does your dad pray very regularly? regularly? And I think it was about 80%, if I remember the numbers right, Never. So there was a vast difference between what was perceived and what was reality, at least in the child's mind. Here we have God telling us that, uh, you know, telling us we must practice what we preach. We all know that. And Jesus is saying that being a leader is not just about, when I say leader, I'm not talking about just elders, you know, deacons, preachers. Of course, the elders are those who are overseers. We understand that. But if we are parents, we inherit that job. We can't push it aside, right? If we are children, we're to follow a lead. If we are parents, we have that responsibility, whether you want it or not. And so here we find it. Jesus saying that being a leader is not just about getting someone to do something, but it also involves rolling up our sleeves and getting busy ourselves. We find, as one man said, and I've mentioned this several times, we need to figure out whether we're brakes or whether we're accelerators, whether we're, we're stoppers or whether or not we're goers. What's going on here? What are we going to be? Am I someone in my family that's, that wants to be on the go because of Jesus Christ? That I'm motivated because of the Word of God? That it excites me because my sins have been taken away? Am I someone that can look at my children and tell them without any shadow of a doubt, the rest of the world may be dark and dreary. The rest of the world may want to tell you lies. The rest of the world may be trying to lead you astray, but I promise you, always, always, this home's going to be a sanctuary where God is first and the Word of God is taught. You see, it's a very vital, important thing for all of us. I didn't get to preach last week. I want to do some preaching today, okay? So you guys just relax. This is what's known as a phylactery. We've talked about it many times. In that part of it, this part of it, of course, they would put most of the times Deuteronomy 6 about verse 4, known as the, the Shema. And in that it says, you know, our God is one God. And they had a long flowing leather piece there that a lot of times they'd wear the phylactery on the back of their hand, on the forearm, sometimes on the forehead. They would try to wrap this around them, most often, seven times, a perfect number. And they wanted to keep that to the forefront. The scribes and the Pharisees would wear these things. We're to examine our motives for wanting to worship and to serve God. We need to know why we're here. And there's a big uproar, you know, about uh, Joel Osteen's wife making the statement. And I, I can't remember, Victoria, is that her name? I don't really know her name, just something to headlines. And she made the statement, which is preposterous. She made the statement, we worship for ourselves, not for God. Well, excuse me, the very idea of the Greek word proskuneo for worship involves God. Bowing down toward, kissing the ground toward, I've told you that many times, kissing the hand of, of who? That which we're worshiping, it involves God. We're not the audience, you see. I, I've told you that over and over again. We have to get that right. She is wrong. Maybe where they worship with 20,000 people there, 
Maybe that's what they do. Maybe they, they're it's more focused on them than it is on God. More likely it probably is. But see, the idea of it is that we gather together and we sing our songs to whom? One another? Well, we exhort one another, but our songs are being sung to whom? God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's the audience. We are participants. You see, a lot of times we miss this. Need to ask the motives why we worship, why we serve God. Matthew 23, 5 through 7. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. And they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. Oh my! They get to call themselves preacher or teacher or leader. And they forget that they are but servants. And so we get to the lesson today. Their motive was to be seen of men. In fact, Jesus told them not to even call another human being father. And I don't believe our Lord was talking in the paternal sense. Of course, it's mentioned in the Bible many times about someone's father. So-and-so fathered this person. And, you know, we see that all along. What he's referring to here is calling someone father in a spiritual sense. I'll never forget being at a place and... uh, uh, I asked a, a, a priest, a Catholic priest, you know, what his name was. And he wasn't shy. He told me. And uh, so I would reference him as, I don't remember what his name was, but by his first name. Someone pulled me aside and said, you know, uh, really, that's not, that's not right. That's not respectful. And I told him basically, you know, I would rather be, if you think it's disrespectful, disrespectful to that man than I would be to God. You know, I, I'm a, supposed to be a, a man of God. I take that very, very seriously. And I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'm trying to be biblically right. I'm not concerned about political correctness. I'm not concerned about those things that people tell me that offends other people. Matthew chapter 15. Uh, you know, I mentioned that verse many, many times. That passage, people came to Christ. And said, Don't you know what you said just offended these people? And Jesus said, if the blind lead the blind, they both fall into a ditch. Jesus said, if you're waiting for an apology from me for standing for the word of God and truth, you're looking at the wrong place. That's Jesus. Only perfect man that ever walked this earth. And he realized that if you stood up for the truth, scribes and Pharisees didn't always get it, but if you stood up for the truth, it's going to humble you, number one, and it's going to offend people, number two. From the way the world is changing and from the way things are being accepted today. You know, this is coming in, this is all right, and that's, you know, this used to be taboo, now it's accepted practice and all this. From those things that are coming in today, if you're living a Christian life, you can't help but offend somebody. I'll promise you that. So, you know, just... Just uh, understand that. Don't turn a blind eye to what I just said. Or a blind thought or however you're supposed to say that. Matthew 23 and verse 9. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Don't elevate somebody to where they're not supposed to be elevated. Right? People ask me, you know, what am I supposed to call you? Superman? Spider-Man? He-Man? Or Jack. I'm partial to Jack. Jackie Jean bothers me a little bit, but I'm partial to Jack. But aren't we supposed to call you like Holy Right Reverend Potentate Exalted One or something like this? No, Jack's just fine. Good enough for my mama and my dad, and it's good enough, good enough for me. Well, now, everybody else, listen. And when I tell people this, I think we ought to call you reverend or something. I've had people say that. I say, you know, the only time that word used, you've heard this all your life if you've been in the church any length of time. The only time reverend's ever used in the Bible refers to God. It's used once that I remember. And it refers to God. I'm not going to exalt myself or let anyone else exalt me to that. I'm lucky to be called Jack. Well, if you get all these degrees, are we supposed to call you doctor or, or master or 
What are we supposed to call you? Jack. You don't know why? Because being called brother in Christ is a greater privilege than anything else on this earth. I don't care what it, you want to name, what do you want to attach to that? We're not going to get done today, church. Woe number one. I'll get through two or three of these. Woe number one involves no conscience or heart. And I, I've uh, taken the liberty to put my own thought on that. I'm talking about in the, in the title of that. You know, when I'm talking about no conscience, no heart, and you'll see why I list these. I'm talking about different parts of the body. Matthew 23, 13. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. I've told you many, many times. Hypocrite comes from a Greek word that's a theatrical word that means putting on a show. For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. These are people that are representing God. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Now watch carefully what he's saying. You, phylactery wearing, tassel wearing, mockeries of Almighty God, listen to me. You are shutting the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You won't even allow them to go in. And I have news for you. You're not going in either. Because all you are is show and no go. Watch this. Application to us is not to let our lives get in the way of someone else's Christianity. Wow. As a parent, that's one of the questions I have to ask myself. As a child of God, it's one of the questions I must ask myself. Is my life and my example getting in the way and standing in the way of somebody else's Christianity? Is how I'm living taking people farther away from God instead of closer to Him? I'm going to pull back the curtain a little bit and share with you what I pray about sometimes, what I pray about every night. I pray about the congregation. I pray about our elders. And I ask for forgiveness for myself. But in that prayer, I always, always include. Let us live our lives as examples before people that they could follow us and be right. Now, I don't know how you feel about that, but I take that very, very seriously. Don't put a do not disturb sign on the kingdom of God. You listening to me? Some people may live that way. I've run across people that the way they live and the way they talk, this is not being, well, I guess it is being judgmental, but it's a correct judgment, John 7, 24, where to make a righteous judgment. But when you listen to them talk, it's like they have special insight and they want to tell God who can go in and who can't go in. God, you want to know who deserves grace? Contact me. I'll let you know. I'll make it my business to know all the dirt about everyone else. You want to know something, God? Ask me. I'll tell you. And over and over again, you find in Scripture where people make a judgment. You're going to well, we won't see it today. We won't have time. Where people make a judgment about someone and they're wrong. Now listen. On woe number two, it, I believe it involves the feet, simply because Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you travel across the sea and land to make a single proselyte. A proselyte is a convert. Uh, in this context, it is a, a Gentile that converted to Judaism. And even in that, they had a, a bronze laver and all this. They had to go through a ceremonial washing, which involved a, a form of baptism. And when he, be, when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. You know why? Because he follows your example. You see, it's a very scary thing. Jesus is not playing around with the holier-than-thou crowd. And I've got news for you. He doesn't do it today either. It is also true that our Lord wasn't giving up on them either. Why do you think he's addressing them? This is the beauty of God and his love, his mercy, and his grace. Hey, you. You that are, are, are preaching the truth but not living it. I'm telling you now, you're destined for a place other than the kingdom of heaven. 
And the reason I'm telling you that is for one reason. Because I love you, I'm concerned about you, and I'm not giving up on you. You have until death to get it right. The question is, can you take the criticism? You see, this just goes hand in hand. We'll just, that's kind of pretty eye right there, isn't it? Woe number three involves the eyes. And uh, you look at this and he says, Woe to you blind guides, that's where you have it, the one out of the seven that addresses the blind guides, who say if anyone swears by the temple it is nothing, but if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. What Jesus is saying, let me tell you what you've done. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7 would later say, we walk by faith, not by what, church? Sight. He says, you look at the temple and you miss the holiness that it represents, the presence of God that it represents, and you look at the goal within and you say, that's it. And you're, you, you put more emphasis on the gold, you blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred. Don't let your eyes lead you rather than the word of God. And don't let scripture mean what it was never meant to mean. Well, our Lord and Savior is just getting right with the people here, the, the scribes and the Pharisees. What you're looking at here is a little plant called cumin. Have you heard of that? Dent mill and, and cumin. And uh, woe number four involves the hands. I've got time to go through a couple of these. But in this, Matthew 22, 23 through 24, Jesus is talking about them being very, 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 very meticulous in what they believe. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. It wasn't that they didn't read the word. It wasn't that they didn't study the word. It wasn't that they didn't meticulously try to go through it and, and get everything out of it. It was the problem of living it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you play actors, you acting like you're in a theater. Acting like the whole world's a stage. For you tithe, mint, and dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guide, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Some people look at that as New Testament humor. Our Lord trying to be funny in a very serious situation. You strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. I heard one preacher say, I wonder if the Pharisees said, you know, I want one hump or two humps. You'll catch on to that later on and laugh. I won't obviously be around to witness it. But here you go. Cumin is a weed like parsley. And the matter is being addressed is they would see to it that their tithing involved even down to the smallest produce from the ground. They wanted to make sure they gave. Man, our focus is on this giving idea, you know. And, you know, giving is a very, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, and other places we find 1 Corinthians 8 and 9, and 2 Corinthians and all. We find about giving. Galatians 1, about verse, verses 6 and 7, 5 through 7. We find the whole idea of that. But what he's saying is, you're involved in down to the, the smallest produce from the ground, but they held back the total giving of themselves. He says, you see to it that people who can afford it give the bulls and the calves and the sheep and all that stuff as you should. And that they, they get down to the idea of, of giving a, a dove or a pigeon. Down to the idea of giving a meal offering, whatever they can afford, down to the idea of this. To mint, to deal, to, to cumin. Making sure meticulously that they get, but then you turn around and you don't give yourselves. Well, one other part of this, and sound room, I'm going to close with this point right here. Don't want to, but I'm going to. Woe number five involves the mind. Jesus said to them, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, and the outside also may be clean. You see, they had it in their mind. You know, that, that as long as they 
were right in their own eyes, everything was fine. It was always dangerous when you think it is all right to demand more of someone else than you do yourself. You always remember that. When it comes to scripture and religion, right religion, when it comes to living for Christ, it's always dangerous to demand more of someone else than you do yourself. We're not to be like billboards. I've mentioned this so many times. We're not to be like billboards in our Christianity where we put up a good front But upon further scrutiny, we are empty, shallow, and lack the true depth of character we've been faking for years. You see it often on the sets of Hollywood. Do you not? You know, movie sets. uh, Go back and watch old episodes of of, uh, Gunsmoke and Bonanza and shows like that. You know, the great ones. You know, those that should still be on. You go back and watch those, those older ones and... And what you loved as a child now looks so fake. You know, the city, you could tell that, you know, if if old Chester or Festus would have sneezed, the whole city would have collapsed. And some Christians live their lives that way. They're just like painted billboards. Here I am, neon signs. And you go and look behind and there's nothing there but a skeleton. An incomplete edifice, an incomplete building. Well, what makes us complete in Christ? Number one, it's the idea of obedience. And as I always say, Scripture, I I give you book, chapter, and verse. I'm going to do it again this morning because it's that important. Book, chapter, and verse. Bible tells us, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. We have to hear the Word of God in order to have that faith begun in our lives. We are to believe. Jesus said while walking on this earth, John 8 and verse 24, he said, except you believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. The word die there from death, thanatos, be separated from God. You're going to die in your sins. You're going to be separated from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and verse 2. Jesus said you have to repent. Repent means to turn from the way you're going now and go in a total different direction. Repentance is only proven by the way we live. Luke 13 and verse 3, unless you repent, I say you shall all likewise what? Perish. Luke 13, 3 through 5. Jesus said we need to confess. The Apostle Paul said it too. Paul said it in Romans 10, 9 and 10. That confession is made unto, the word unto in the Greek means toward salvation. Jesus said it in Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Whoever denies me before men, I'll deny before my Father. Whoever confesses me before men, I'll confess before my Father. Jesus being the the mediator between God and men. Then we're told to be baptized. Jesus said it himself. Matthew 16, about verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Now a lot of people want to come to you and tell you that It doesn't say he that believeth and is not baptized, you know, shall be condemned. It says he that believeth and is baptized shall be healed. And the problem with that is, I tell you, being technical here, and you have to get technical because the way it's written in the Greek, but in the Greek, the word he that believeth and is baptized and is a coordinate conjunction, linking things of equal rank and equal value together. That's the rule in the Greek, it's the rule in the English, it's the rule in every language I know that uses a conjunction. And so what it's saying is that as as important as baptism is, as important as belief, as important as belief is, is as important as baptism. I cannot, church, go to that verse of Scripture and say, he that is baptized shall be saved. That's not what it says. I can't go to that scripture and say, he that believes is saved. It's not what it says. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He says they're both important, both must be done. It's why he said, go into all the world, making disciples, baptizing them, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Some people come along, and I'm going to close with this as I walk down off here gingerly. But I'll close with this. Some people say, well, now, wait a minute, Jack. Romans 10, about verse 31 says, All who shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I believe that scripture with every fiber of my being. 
But let's wait and see what that scripture means. Who wrote the book of Romans, church? Paul? Okay. In Acts chapter 22, Paul is recanting, recounting, not recanting, recounting his, his, his conversion. And there he says in Acts 22 and verse 16, Ananias came to him and taught him about the gospel. Remember, he'd been blinded. He's in Damascus. He was miserable. Ananias comes to him and says, why tarriest thou? In other words, why are you waiting? Basically saying, Paul, I don't want you to eat anything or drink anything. Why are you waiting? Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized. Now why? Calling, you know, that your sins may be forgiven. Calling on the name of the Lord. How did the apostle Paul call on the name of the Lord? Through baptism. The same Apostle Paul that called on through baptism tells us, Romans 10, 31, that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I wonder what he was meaning. Same thing he did. Maybe someone here today needs to repent. Maybe someone here today, you're already a child of God, you need to repent, ask for forgiveness, ask for prayers for strength. Maybe someone here today that's never been baptized the right way. Now don't be misled. If you can be baptized right, you can be baptized wrong. Sprinkling is not baptism. Pouring or effusion is not baptism. Baptism is dipping, immersing, plunging, or overwhelming. It's getting someone all the way under. Romans chapter 6, 3 and 4 says it is a burial. There's not a single one of you, if I tell you you take this cane outside and bury it. Let me, let me do this. I have to point at you again. You know, take this cane outside and bury it. It's going to go out there and sprinkle a little dirt on it and say, I did it. Everyone in this room of accountable age knows that if you're going to bury this cane, you're going to have to get it all the way under the dirt. Especially if I said, I'll give you $100 if you do it. Now I've excited you. I'm going to expect, inspect what you do. I'll give you $100. This is just a story, church, okay? Go bury this. I wonder how many would get it wrong. Not a single one of you. How do we mess up Scripture? Because someone leads us astray like the scribes and the Pharisees were on that day. If you have a need, won't you come as we stand and sing?